It doesn't happen often. In fact, it hardly ever happens. A brand new franchise finds its way onto a new system that becomes so incredibly popular that every single system after not only gets a new release, but more importantly, that single game can completely change the outcome of that particular console. But that is the power of Mario Kart. Sure, it may have started its life on the incredible Super Nintendo, becoming simply a fantastic game, but by its next release on the Nintendo 64, it had solidified itself as one of the most important game franchises, not only for Nintendo fans, but all fans. Everybody loves Mario Kart, and for good reason. It pretty much is the perfect kart racer that for the most part has got better and better with every release. It's so goddamn popular that every time a kart racer comes out from a different series, they are always tarnished with the brush, not as good as Mario Kart, well almost. But I'll leave you guys to decide that below. Regardless, Mario Kart is a great series of games, and a game series that brings people of all ages back together for many an awesome night of pure rubber banding bliss. So, before the gushing continues, I think it's time that I say, join me as we take a look into the Mario Kart Complete History, where we'll be looking at the game's humble beginnings, its incredible legacy, its devoted fans, and of course, the games. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. That. Damn, that's a lot of consoles, all of which have had a Mario Kart game released onto them. Yep, there are currently 8 or 9 if you count deluxe home console games in the Mario Kart franchises. You got 4 released in the arcades, an unreleased game, and a potential Mario Kart mobile game expected to drop very, very soon. Although, depending on when you watch this, uh, you know, that may have already happened. If it is, then I'm sure you can check my channel for a full review of it. And if that is the case, well, that's not why you're here, is it? Because... I think we're in fact getting a little ahead of ourselves here, guys. So, let's go back to the beginning. We all know this guy, Mr. Shigeru Miyamoto. You can't go five minutes about this legend coming up. And as you may have guessed, back in the day, he was the lead of a small team of eight who eventually worked on Super Mario Kart. But as much as he oversaw what went on and technically gave the go-ahead that would bring life to Nintendo's most popular spin-off, it was actually Tadashi Sagayama and Hideki Kono who were the true legends to the Mario Kart series. Sagiyama-san joined Nintendo a good seven or eight years earlier and was the brainchild to the NES game Ice Climbers. And Kono's son came in a year or so later with his very first game, Ice Hockey. Both games were successes for the time, and as you may have guessed, it helped put the duo on the Nintendo world map as they continue to help develop plenty of games for years to come, including such greats as Super Mario Bros. 3, Zelda 2, Pilot Wings, Super Mario World, and SimCity, to name a few. Now, the Nintendo fans among you will notice we have already moved into the early 90s as some of these games were released for Nintendo's best, the Super Nintendo. And it's at this point that I'm going to pause the video and suggest that you make your way over to my previous complete history called F-Zero The Complete History. Because it was Miyamoto-san that tasked these two with making a follow-up to that game with the sole mission being to turn it into a multiplayer video game. You see, as good as F-Zero was, and still is, is a racing game that's only for one player. Looking back now, that's pretty crazy, but for the time, nobody besides the critics cared because it looked so stunning and futuristic that it didn't matter how limited it was in that regard, people still wanted to play it. And with it being such a big success and Miyamoto famously only really wanting to make sequels that he could actually improve upon the game before them, he tasked Kono-san and Sagiyuma-san with doing just that, a multiplayer F-Zero. 
F0 displays the layer for a course over an area of 100 screens in order to create a feeling of speed and scale. However, because of hardware limitations, splitting the screen for multiplayer required the courses to be displayed within an area no more than 4 TV screens wide by 4 screens high, i.e. 16 screens. We tried creating an F0 style circuit within that limitation, but found it too difficult to race in with an F1 type vehicle, making it impossible to create a course that could give you a feeling of speed. And there the issue lies. It could be done, but it would have involved removing certain elements of that original F-Zero game that would have resulted in a game that just didn't feel as fluid, fast or futuristic. And well, what's the point in that? The next step was to take what they had already done with the sluggish and small F-Zero prototype sequel game and try something else. This was all happening in the fall of 1990 and after reading an introductory book on kart racing, watching a video called Drift Contest and finally going to the Nemo no Satu amusement park for a day of kart racing for um, research purposes, they finally found a style of racing that not only works well at slower speeds but more importantly didn't seem ridiculous when played on a track that was all bunched up together which meant that Miyamoto-san finally got his multi multiplayer racing game using that all important mode 7. On top of this, in the very early 90s during development it seemed that kart racing was becoming quite the fun pastime. People from all over were reading news articles about famous drivers like Cena and Agura Suzuki which obviously just helped push the idea even further. A fun, light-hearted game where you can zip around unrealistically in cars. It wouldn't be the life or death dangerous world of F1 racing, but more of the atmosphere of screeching wheels as you zip around an amusement park. When people play this game, they're going to have a big smile on their face. That was a big goal for us, a game where both players and onlookers would be laughing and smiling. Everything was coming together quite nicely. It was very much at this point trial and error and the team would all sit incredibly close to one another and would often just walk over to each other's desk to make sure they all had the same vision in mind. The idea was to make it fun and because of this, even though multiplayer was very much the original plan, they made a group decision not to play it in multiplayer during development hardly at all. The reason being was that when gamers start to compete against each other, more hardcore tactics come into play. And that original fun idea of whizzing, zipping and drifting around a race course would start to drive off into the sunset and be replaced with a more hardcore tone. Make it a fun single player experience and if that works, then so will the multiplayer. Mario! カメノコラに気をつけろ。あら、とととととと。うわ、ご苦労さん。これはまたすごい。レッドヒートと思った。よし、ペッタン。残念でした。こんな時はバナナの皮をそんなバナナ。あとはゲームで会いましょう。スー
For other races, we chose more characters from the Mario franchise who could also be clearly recognized from behind. This was the first step in the creation of Super Mario Kart. Without this hardware limitation, we might have ended up with a different racing game. And boy did they. Mario, Luigi, Princess Peach, Toad, Yoshi, Donkey Kong Jr, Koopa Trooper and Bowser. They all found their way into this series thanks to their recognisable back of their heads. And with that, not only did Nintendo have a bloody good playable game on their hands, but now they had Nintendo's most popular names attached to it to help give it even more fun filled and let's be honest, most important importantly, star-studded appeal. For the time, this was quite odd. Mario going up against the girlfriend stealing Donkey Kong and Bowser in a friendly match of go-karting was fairly odd, but the way Miyamoto sees it, it wasn't an issue. Mario appearing in lots of different kinds of games is also in line with comic tradition. With this in mind, I had absolutely no objections with enemy characters racing against rivals or characters you can control yourself. And with that, not only did it get recognisable characters and fun gameplay that everybody and their mum can get to grips with, the addition of weapons or power-ups, I should say, naturally came after. The first item added was oil. That eventually became the banana, of course, and from there, plenty more offensive and defensive weapons were included to mix up the gameplay and obviously make this feel more like a true Mario game, which they obviously did with shells, ghosts, and invincibility stars. It may have started off as a failed sequel, but it quickly became the birth of a series of games that quite literally never stopped being the most important games in Nintendo's rich catalogue. By today's standards, however, you may have trouble with this one. Don't hate me. It is true, my wife, who is a big Mario Kart fan from Double Dash onwards, found the original on the Super Nintendo Mini a little eye-piercing and of course limited. And although my angry retro gamer self came jumping up and shouting to defend such a legendary title, I can't deny it. I kinda see where she's coming from. Again, I am a retro gamer at heart and I can easily look past the limited view, technically invisible walls and the flat surfaces that makes it look like you're just driving around a car park. And I mean, seriously, I only really like playing Mode 7 racing games on a CRT. But again, for newcomers, this may be a step back too far for most. And although as stated, this sold like mushroom-filled hotcakes 8.76 million units to be exact, and for its time, it was probably the very best multiplayer game ever released. If you are a hardcore retro Nintendo fan, according to several polls I have seen online, it's very much likely that yes, Super Mario Kart will indeed hold a special place in your heart, but the best was yet to come. It's me, Mario! Super Mario Kart was released back in 1992 in most places, and it was 1993 for us Brits. And only a few years later in 1996, Nintendo released the Nintendo 64 with the well-established Mario in his own outing as a launch title, which was obviously a rather impressive system seller shipping a shade under 12 million units. But, it wasn't the only Mario game destined to be a system seller being developed. Super Mario Kart R, the R stood for rendered by the way, was also being worked on. With this being a new system in Nintendo being well Nintendo, the game had to step it up and utilise whatever new features were on offer. This time round, that ended up being four players. Miyamoto remembers his programmers claiming that a four player split screen mode would be impossible, but unlike F-Zero's failed multiplayer, they thankfully got it to work. Again, certain bits needed to be gimped in order to get four separate screens all pulling off individual 3D calculations, and easily the most notable was the characters themselves. As this was a 3D rendered system, quite a bit of memory was saved when the team decided to make the characters as pre-rendered sprites. And on top of this, a technique known as billboarding was used to show other players that appear in your screen, again as 3D images, when in fact, well, they were essentially a billboard. As stated before, Super Mario 64 and Mario Kart 64 were being developed at the same time, with the intended plan to release both at the same time. 
This obviously didn't happen as that release of the N64 drew closer. Miyamoto and the powers that be at Nintendo decided to inject more money and resources into finishing Super Mario 64 on time rather than Mario Kart 64 on time. And yes, that most definitely does make sense. <laughs> Mario Kart 64。ユーユーコージョ。ニンテンドー64でしか体験できない新しい迫力のバトルレース。2人、3人、4人対戦プレイなら超面白い。So, Mario Kart 64, the one that every fan of the series absolutely loves. 12 tracks to race on before, but now you've actually got 16. Each track is incredibly memorable and features a unique style and sometimes gameplay mechanics that helps it stand out. And when you put it all together, it's obviously why most Nintendo fans absolutely adore this entry in the franchise. Mix all of this together with one of the N64's best-selling features, easy four-player ability, and you've got a game that will fully stand the test of time. There's nothing quite like getting three of your best mates round filling up on cheap supermarket coke and crisps while you play past the Mad Cat's controller racing and, of course, battling in Mario Kart 64. Yep, the battle mode in this game was so good that it ended up being the version that everybody relates back to when they uh, <laughs> don't exactly get it right. I mean, yes, the original had a battle mode too, and of course, multiplayer SNES gamers sure did love a bit of that, but with the N64, playing the game on a 3D landscape really did open up the possibilities that this mode could provide. Now that we're using 3D models, we can have shadows, and things can be hidden behind other things and you can look up or down on your opponent. It makes the strategies in battle mode very different from the first game. Of course, all of that is obvious stuff, but it's things we had really wanted to include in Super Mario Kart. The game was eventually released in 1996 for Japan and early in 1997 for the rest of the world, and surprisingly the reviews were incredibly polarised. Some critics saw the big leap forward as one of the greatest games ever made, whilst others saw it as nothing but a slight upgrade over the original, and that the rubber banding technique removed any real competition needed for a game like this. This was no doubt due to the blue shell that got included in this game, providing relatively bad players with the ability to knock back first place. Something that has been a staple of this series ever since, for better or worse. Time for another five year break. Billy, don't be a hero. Now four can play off one cartridge. Mario Kart for Game Boy Advance. Rated E for everyone. Game Boy Advance. Game Boy Advance ならではの4人対戦. 
スリリングなデッドヒート新しいコースが次々登場マリオカートアドバンスマリオカートスーパーサーキット was the very next game released in the series this time being supervised by the original duo rather than being completely looked after by them This time, it was Intelligent Systems, more well known as the Fire Emblem and Paper Mario series, that took the lead here. And as previously stated when talking about this developer, a lot of the time they was known for simply porting a Super Famicom Disk System game over to an NES cartridge, before getting given video game creating roles of their own. This version of the Mario Kart series makes a lot more sense when you look at it like this nowadays. There are advancements that make use of the new Game Boy Advance's hardware, but most of all, if you played a lot of Super Mario Kart, you are no doubt going to be quite familiar with what is on offer here. Why? Because all 20 racetracks from the original SNES are here once again. But don't let that put you off because you need to unlock them. There are another 20 tracks in this game to start with, giving this tiny little game a grand total of 40 tracks, which is still the most for any game in the series when you don't take into account DLC or re-releases, of course. Now that doesn't mean this game should replace your copy of Super Mario Kart because its playstyle is slightly different. Now granted I most definitely have not played it as much as the original but from what I can tell this is tailored much more towards your classic hardcore Mario Kart fan. Most Mario Karts are a tad easy and yes there is still a good amount of rubber banding going on in this game but put this game on 150cc from the get go and you will have a hard time working your way through the difficult stages. It's hard to pinpoint exactly what makes it so hard, I mean I suppose it's the handling of the drifting that is most apparent but more importantly is that this new difficulty doesn't make it a bad game. In fact when asking people on my discord, link below, and social media pages, link below, I got the impression that hardcore fans of the classic style actually really liked the game due to its difficulty spike the later you get on in the game. Don't let its simplistic look and recycled content put you off, when you start playing you will realise just how unique this version is. Also, link it up. Yep, with only one cart, you and up to three friends could play multiplayer on this game, the first ever handheld Mario Kart game in the series. Also, one more first before moving on if you lived in Japan. From its release up until December 14th, 2002, you could actually take your game online. It was believed that this wasn't a race as such, but instead to exchange ghost times in the game. Still, it is rather impressive, don't you agree? Right, that's another console ticked off the list. What's next? Ah, yes, the GameCube. It was reported on IGN back on June the 6th, 2001 that during that year's E3, a seven second clip of an upcoming untitled Mario Kart game was announced and it reads, The preview, running in real time, lasted approximately seven seconds. In it, Mario and Luigi sped their carts along a bump mapped 3D surface void of any curves. The scene lacked a background entirely, but when Mario power slid his vehicle toward the camera and Luigi gleefully followed, the crowd of press at the unveiling cheered and clapped. Mario Kart for GameCube had been officially confirmed. Yeah, it's quite funny and humble to look back at an entire article being created on one seven second clip, but considering this is only game number four in the series, it does show just how incredibly popular the franchise had already become. Sadly, that excitement didn't last very long. Obviously, you will have noticed already that the trailer looks nothing like the game that would eventually be released. And regardless, after that tiny clip was released, Mario Kart for the Nintendo GameCube went completely silent for a good couple of years. During this time, it is reported that development was rocky at best, as the team really did struggle to design new features that fans of the series would like. On top of this, the chief of directors, Kiyoshi Mizuki, was tasked by Miyamoto-san himself to create a game that newcomers that have never played a game in the series before could get to grips with instantly. And he did this by making the game as simple as possible. 
What followed was screenshot after footage after screenshot again. And honestly, those lucky people that got to play it at the shows that it was playable at didn't really like what they tried. The game was incredibly slow and sluggish. However, every time it was showed off up until its release, it got slightly better with obvious tweaks being made and most importantly, the game speeding up. Turns out Nintendo was listening and listening well, because on November of 2003 the game was finally released worldwide, and although there are certain fans that really, really do not like this entry, those that do often claim that this incredibly unique version of the Mario Kart series is indeed the very best. My wife, or should I say my girlfriend at the time, was one of them, as I bought her a GameCube with Mario Kart and Monkey Ball as a gift one Christmas when she was going off to uni, and plenty of drinking games were injected into this already awesome game for many years to come every time I visited her. And sure, I have some serious awesome yet blurry memories of playing this one, but who cares? The game, for me, was seriously awesome. The graphics had been boosted up considerably, the sound was impeccable, and yes, even though it was very approachable for newcomers, hardcore fans of the series really did get a kick out of easily the most risky new mechanic in the entire franchise, two racers on one cart. This feature alone is the main reason certain people are not the biggest fan of the game, but learn to master this new technique and learn to flip your characters at the right time to either double up your weapons or store them and you will not be disappointed. Deciding what duo to team up doesn't just affect the weight, speed and controlling of your vehicle, but more importantly each character has their very own special item and making sure you get the right two together can be quite an experimental joy to work out. The game featured 20 playable characters which are divided into 10 pairs, it has 21 different carts and for the first time they get pretty odd in this one and finally you've got 16 tracks spread across 4 different cups. Oh yeah, and the battle mode also reappears with 6 courses, 2 of which are completely exclusive to the game featuring the awesome GameCube lid. Yeah, I know it's basic, but I love this one. The game also features LAN gaming via the GameCube broadband adapter for the two people that ever did use that, which lets you connect 8 GameCubes together for up to 16 player multiplaying races. I seriously don't know anyone that ever, ever did this. But if you did, leave a comment below. Massive thumbs up to you. Speed Nintendo GameCube Mario Kart Double Dash! Hot Mario! Mario Kart Double Dash. Drive, throw stuff, switch. Only for Nintendo GameCube. They leave for everyone. GameCube. As stated, critics and fans mostly loved it. Obviously not enough for Nintendo to ever do the double racing thing again, even as an added extra, sadly. And the game eventually became the second best selling game for the GameCube, only being beaten, obviously, by Super Smash Bros. Melee. Bringing us into 2005 when Nintendo had yet another gaming system out, which obviously means they needed to put another Mario Kart game out too. Brits, Brazilians, Chinese. Race players from around the world with Nintendo DS Wi Fi connection. It's free, simple, and safe. Mario Kart DS, now also available in an exclusive pack. Hot Mario! Silver play, silver play. Oh no, come on! Mamma mia, per favore! Donna Gaos, that's your tenure. Whoa! Whoa! Wi-Fi 
the fifth game in the series brought back Hideki Kono as the main guy to work on it. And as always with a new game and system with new features and techniques, they needed to add something new into this game. That was of course after taking away the double racers found in the previous game and essentially making a classic styled Mario Kart game. A couple of new characters made their way into this entry including Rob the Robot which I loved and as always a few classic tracks were also included in an attempt to bring classic gamers to the new game. However, the biggest changes for this were not only the 8 player connectivity with only one single cartridge that can play up to 8 tracks with each additional player being a different coloured shy guy, but if you all have the same cartridge then every track and every racer is selectable and even better, so is the battle mode. Another feature that was added for the first time was online gameplay. Pretty simple stuff by today's standards of course, but for Nintendo and handheld gaming especially considering it was Mario Kart, it was rather legendary and of course important. And really not a whole lot else needed to be added. Sure they could have added some touch screen stuff over onto that bottom screen and to be fair they did play around with this idea by getting players to be able to drop items anywhere on the map. But this just turned into more of a problem than anything else resulting in the focus being pulled away from that original karting experience. Thankfully for this game they only added what they needed with yet again online gameplay being the key selling feature and the reviews came in yet again incredibly positive. And even though the Nintendo DS's library was so vast, this one was yet again the third best selling game on the platform only being overtaken by new Super Mario Bros and Nintendogs. One feature they did include however, which sadly isn't as heavily implemented as I would like nowadays, is the mission mode. In this mode you play as a specific character on a specific course completing challenges. Don't get me wrong, racing alone is the most important part of any of the Mario Kart games, but when you have challenges like this it what makes games like Sonic and All-Star Racing and Wacky Races even stand out against Mario Kart and I really do wish they would focus on adding these into future renditions of the game, but they just don't seem to be bothered by it. <sighs> right, moving on. Yep, another Nintendo console means another Mario Kart, but this time it's going from Nintendo's best selling ever handheld to Nintendo's best selling ever home console, the Nintendo Wii. I said it before and I'll say it again, everyone and their grandmothers had a Nintendo Wii and this was one that Nintendo was most definitely not going to be passing up on. The big new thing here was most definitely the motion controls and even though plenty of games came and went with mixed results in the driving genre, everybody was waiting for Mario and his frenemies to show them how it's done. This is yet again another game in the series that people tend to love or hate. So besides the obvious motion controls which thankfully are not required but most importantly are pretty good and easy to get the hang of which is what all of the games in the series strive for, there was another big difference too, motorbikes. In fact there are hardly any carts in this game at all, taking what Double Dash started and pushing it even further, what you have is a mishmash of different vehicle types that ended up becoming a staple for the series. All of the carts are based on the weight of your character, therefore fatter characters will not work in baby vehicles etc and yet again that adds some serious depth to a game that at first glance may seem a little bit shallow. Yet again you got 16 new tracks and 16 old tracks but the real difference here is that instead of 8 races at a time which was the standard you now go up against 12 making each race a lot more frantic with opponents constantly slinging projectiles your way. Or so it seems. On top of that with the Wii's Me feature Nintendo also implemented these Playmobil looking characters into the game too and finally tricks were included for even more frantic gameplay. However with all that said the frantic gameplay may actually be the part of the reason why so many gamers hate this number 6. 
The rubber banding is here and it does feel stronger than ever with the blue shell popping up constantly. But the big problem is that there's just way too much rubber banding and for some the better you do the worse you will get as first place getting hit with almost anything means you're going to be falling back several spaces at once whilst two thirds of the racers whiz past you. Hardcore gamers will understand what needs to be done to break this annoying feature for some, and yet even more just see it as a Mario Kart game with a nice extra layer of challenge implemented. However for me, and it seems like quite a few others, this feature can hinder my enjoyment a tad more than it perhaps should. Regardless of what you may think, I think Nintendo did seriously well with this one. 37.4 million units sold, not only making it the second best selling game for the system, but get this, the 10th best selling game ever made. Bringing us along nicely to Mario Kart 7. Yet again, another top selling game for the system. Actually, this time it literally was the best selling game for the system. And fair play. This was not only Nintendo themselves involved in making it, but now they had the amazing Retro Studios involved, who worked on the Donkey Kong Country Returns games and the previously mentioned Metroid Prime series too. This was done as only 18 players were working on the game with higher priorities being given to games such as Skyward Sword and if there was any chance to get the game finished on time then outside help was most definitely going to be needed. When Retro Studios came on board they spent a long time studying those earlier tracks made in the more popular games to get a good understanding about what worked and what didn't. This small team headed by the series founder resulted in a game that really was something quite special. More features were added this time round such as the gliding and underwater driving making certain parts of the track change the way your car is handled and on top of the new characters and customization, which went as far as selecting the body gliders and tires making for easily the most extreme customization to date with a grand total of 1190 different combinations I think they nailed this one. Again, the game reviewed mostly positively, which is pretty impressive for the seventh game in the series, but there were a few people that actually believed that this was perhaps a step too far and the gliding and underwater sections are here only to trick you into believing that this is something more than it actually is. The seventh game in 19 years. Although I don't personally agree with this, I do see where they're coming from. Adding mission modes or a few extra gameplay modes in general would have made the game even better for me. But when I finally got to play the eighth game in the series, I finally saw this for what it was, a stepping stone that it very much was towards the greatest kart racing game of all time. Mario Kart 8, upside down test. Take four. That good. Mario Kart 8 is here, and it's flipping racing on its head. You can race on walls, and even upside down. Every kart, every track, every item has been insanely tested for flipping fun. <laughs> Mario Kart 8, only on Wii U. Rated E for everyone. Mario Kart 8, for its time, was the best game in the series, including those weird spin-offs I'm yet to cover. The big problem was, besides the colour TV game and the Virtual Boy, it was on Nintendo's worst-selling, although highly underappreciated, system. 
Mario Kart 8 was and still is incredible. 16 new and 16 old tracks again. Stunning HD, a huge roster of characters and customizations, online play, excellent music. Seriously, the best in the series, if you ask me. DLC that was not only fairly priced, but gave you not only a few extra characters from massive franchises like The Legend of Zelda and Animal Crossing, but more importantly, 16 new tracks, and a couple of which actually gave a little something extra for the more retro among us, like the F-Zero and Excitebike tracks. The game sold so incredibly well for a poor selling system that sales shut up on the Wii by a staggering 662% just because of this game. And sure you could look at that as damn how bad was that system actually selling and the answer is really bad, like really really bad. But it's games like Mario Kart 8 that pumped a massive lungful of life into the system with what I believe and most of you that answered my questions on social media and discord, link below, will agree is without a doubt the very best Mario Kart game ever released. There's not a lot else that needs to be said and the new feature of the game, the anti-gravity racing, was probably the game's main selling point besides it being the first ever HD Mario Kart game and yet again at first it may seem like a gimmick but when you realise how many times you can use this to boost by bumping into other players and pillars during these sections yet in a Mario Kart hardcore gaming self will come out of its blue shell as you dodge every opponent in kart mode and enter destruction derby mode when upside down. It's fair to say that this is no longer this. The game has had so many little bits and bobs added for better or worse during its life and for me, I'm currently sitting in a position of dumbfoundedness asking what could they possibly do to make this any better. Well, that's where this comes in. It's essentially the same game, but for a far more popular system, with a few added tweaks and characters, but most importantly, it scraps Mario Kart 8's only awful feature, the battle mode, which was essentially just small versions of tracks where you attempted to shoot each other, into a good old fashioned standard arena shoot 'em up. By this point, it's safe to say that Mario Kart is huge business, not only for Nintendo, but for everyone. It's arguably Nintendo's most recognisable franchise, and maybe that's because it features all of Nintendo's franchises, but still, it was popular enough to not only get a nice Happy Meal selection of toys, but even a collaboration with Mercedes-Benz, not only to include Mario Co. in Merc adverts in Japan, but to also include Mercs into Mario Kart 8 as free DLC too. Easily the weirdest crossover ever. Actually, I uh, take that back. The popularity of this game didn't stop there either when the infamous Luigi death stare became an internet sensation and in the end, as stated, Mario Kart 8 for my beloved Nintendo Wii U easily became the best selling game for the system, almost doubling the sales of second place, which was Super Mario 3D World. I think it goes without saying, if you've got this or this, Go and get this or this. So, there you have it, the complete history of the mainline Mario Kart series. Eight games, plus a re-release, which for the most part can be seen as getting better and better and better. But, as you know, there was an unreleased game for another one of Nintendo's consoles, the Virtual Boy. Um... Yeah, there's not actually really anything here at all, rather than a magazine claiming that it was coming out. And as for the version that most people believe is the resurfaced ROM, well, that's actually nothing more than a fan project. There was also another Mario game where you sculpt cars out of big chunks of metal using the DS's touchscreen created by Yu Sato of Seaman fame, but honestly, calling it a Mario Kart game, yeah, that one's a bit of a stretch. However, what was 100% a Mario Kart title or 4 was the Mario Kart Arcade GP series. 
These ones are quite strange, not in a bad way, but they are 100% different games. Firstly, you will notice that your car is a lot more zoomed in. You actually have characters from non-Nintendo franchises, and in this first version, you've got Pac-Man. And finally, there's an absurd amount of items to play with, 93 to be exact. However, you can only use three per course, and depending on how well you play or pay, you can take them over to the next course to use there. The reason this is so different is because, besides Nintendo's involvement in quality control purposes, they didn't really do much, and instead, as you may have guessed already, with Pac-Man being involved, these games were made by Bandai Namco. Now, with all of these differences out of the way, what I would like to say is just how good these games are, as quick pick-up and plays, of course. Which is what they should be, right? Sure, they play ever so differently by including features like not getting hit during drifts and essentially every item having homing abilities if locked onto a character long enough, but this is all good in my eyes. This game most definitely breathes new life into the franchise, and I think Nintendo made the right choice bringing such an incredibly important game series into the arcades to help keep it into the public eye. Another amazing feature in this game is that after every cup, if you come first in each of those races, you actually get little challenges where you get to do things like push around a watermelon to the goal or drive backwards. This makes for a funny little pastime in between those cups, and I really do wish Nintendo would add modes like this into their home releases. Anyway, the game was popular enough to get a sequel a few years later called Mario Kart GP2, and besides the fact that this one features Tamagotchi characters as well as Pac-Man characters, it's pretty much the same, except for the fact for the first time in the Mario series you actually have a commentator constantly yabbiting on throughout your play. Next up, about five years later or so, you've got the third arcade game, GPDX, and sadly this time it drops the Tamagotchi characters for the Taiko no Tatsujin characters, and guys, thankfully, this is the version you're always going to be seeing now in bowling alleys or wherever you play your arcade games, and it's the one that you really, really do want to play. The graphics and art style have shot up thanks to the devs no longer using the Triforce on this one, and just like Mario Kart 7 and Eight, this one features gliding and underwater sections too. Everything about this game is awesome, and just like the previous games, it's definitely an arcade feeling game rather than a sort of Mario Kart feeling game, if that makes sense. And on top of that, you also got the battle mode included in this one as well, and a very strange co-op mode where you link your cars together and one of you shoots while the other one steers. I suppose that's sort of like Double Dash. Never tried this mode out myself, but you can be damn sure that I will be next time I go along. Long. And finally, there is one final arcade game in the GP series called Mario Kart Arcade GP VR. And yes, it's a Mario Kart game in VR. Sadly, I've not played this one either, and the footage you're seeing here is from the awesome Nathaniel Bundy channel, link below, and from his review, it seems to be a slightly scaled back from all of the extras that you've come to expect in the GP series, but that's fine because it's incredibly stunning and exciting to look at, and you can be damn sure I'm going to be playing this one too, whenever I can. And there you have it guys, my god how big was this episode, but what did you expect, it's Mario Kart the complete history, an entire history on possibly Nintendo's most important franchise, it's the one Nintendo series that everybody no matter how much you're into gaming can enjoy. For hardcore gamers, they can get deep with its ever-evolving mechanics, and for newcomers, they can just have fun driving around a randomly named monkey chasing plumbers and running from blue shells. <laughs> Good luck. Say that sentence two decades ago and you'd probably cross the street, but nowadays, however, you just basically want to be picking up a controller. Any controller, because these games are everywhere, and as previously stated, they're not going away, with a new mobile game dropping later this year, and of course more Mario Kart tat than you would ever know what to do with, including Scalectrics, Connects, Monopoly games, figurines, clothes, <laughs> seriously, you cannot get away from Mario Kart and that's fine. 
It's a series of games that everybody looks forward to and a series of games that will outlive us all. Not just in the series, but obviously because it's Nintendo, it's going to be getting injected into plenty of other games too. Including ones that Nintendo sadly didn't authorise. <laughs> yep. The people running Mary Car got sued 10 million yen from Nintendo. <laughs> My suggestion? Just go and play Deluxe instead. Hey there guys, thanks for checking out the video. I want to give a big special shout out to this video sponsor, PlayerOneClothing.com. Be sure to go and check them out by clicking the link below and go and fill up your wardrobe with incredible video game and movie related garments. Uh, and also, before moving on to the patrons, I want to give a big special shout out to the people that help by providing their voice for this video. You've got She Says, you've got Greg from Digino Gaming, there's of course Johnny Nitpick, and the Retro future links to all of their channels will be in the description below and finally if you want to go check out any of the games playing on the screen it really does help the show if you use the play asia affiliate link below so that i can continue reviewing things for you guys anyway over to those patrons with a big special shout out going to that retro video gamer gary pinkett mantis ryan burford andrew dalton ben jackson jonathan haywood tomic grabowski christopher turnbull brent craft phil lowlands mr vestek dean Robertson Dunn, Lefty, Intrigued Gaming, Abby Morris, Tim Labonte, Asobi, Quang DX, Tim Lunn, Hananas, Pixels.Limited, aka Samuel Victor, Red the Beard, Conrad Constantine, Pretendo64, Kareem the Elephant, James Loveridge, Casey Garner, Blitz, Hedgy, King Link Reviews, Retro Gaming Castle, Gemma at Mr. T's Shirts, Mike H. Fell, Lucas Softail, Ye Old Hamburger, Gregory Arden, Ronnie Method, SSWB, Solix Captor, Jeremy Rodriguez, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Marcus King Emo Cut Tyndall, June the Geeky Dad, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, Todd Paul Float G, and of course, Petty Mew. If you want to get your name shouted out, get your name shown, come and see what I'm working on and see all of the exclusive stuff that these patrons always get, including previews of what's coming up and random thought ramblings from me then check the link that you see on the screen. You can come and sign up to my Discord as well, where I'm always hanging around. And I think that's probably enough plug-in for today. So for now, this is DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully I'll see you all next time.